The scripture reading this morning is from Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I think one of the dangers of preaching is that a preacher can be so familiar with turning the pages of the Bible and preparing sermons that it doesn't go into your heart. And it's just my conviction that if I open the Bible, I, I just need the Lord to help me preach to myself. I know it sounds weird, but there's times when I listen back to my own sermons and I feel like I don't like listening to myself and just kind of gross myself out a little bit and embarrass myself. And then eventually it's like the word sort of takes over and begins to sort of, I, I begin to hear God speaking through his word. And um, I would tell you this last week, I felt like I wrestled probably more than I ever have with any other sermon, not with the difficulty of what to say, but just the difficulty of believing and taking into my heart this word uh, because it is so critical for us to understand, for those who are in Christ, believers, the security that we have in him and the confidence that we should have. God wants us to be confident in his son, Jesus Christ. And there's so much in our life to lead us away from confidence in Christ and so many insecurities and anxieties and fears that we experience that seek to under, that would undermine our sense of security in Christ. Whatever life stage we're in, we're going to face new sets of insecurities. I think about my own life. When I graduated from college, I experienced a whole, I was confronted with a whole new set of insecurities. By insecurities, I don't mean like insecurity about like who I am and how people see me. I just mean a sense of dangling over danger or needing to find stability for my feet to stand on. When I graduated from college, I was on my own financially for the first time. My parents had helped me through college. Now, I have this new feeling of real financial insecurity where I've got monthly rent to pay. I've got to buy a car, pay for my own gas, car insurance, buy my own groceries, pay all my bills, that type of thing. So financial insecurity was, was a new feeling for me more than it had been. Then I moved into my mid-20s, and I began to feel more of like a relational insecurity because what was happening was that all my friends in our early and into mid-20s, we're getting married off one by one. And I was like the wedding singer. I sang in all their weddings. I was like, when's my day? Like the bridesmaid, never the bride, like the, the wedding singer, but never the guy getting married. And I just began to wrestle with that feeling of like a creeping loneliness in my life and going, Am I ever, is the Lord ever going to provide for me a wife? And he did mercifully in my wonderful wife, Lindsay. And then we had kids and career changes, and I felt a whole new set of insecurities around parenting and how am I going to raise my kids I'd follow Christ in this world. And my, is my career going to be able for, to provide for what we need? And then eventually I hit this major health crisis in my life. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But trig- triggered major, major insecurities about my future. Like, would I be healthy enough to work? Would I be able to support my family? I have three kids and a wife and a mortgage. Am I going to be able to support my family? major insecurities around that, and the Lord graciously brought me through that, and then entered this new sphere of church planting, and all of a sudden, all these unforeseen insecurities began to sort of spring up in my heart like weeds. Like all, this, all these worries that I had that I never had before began to feel a weight and a burden. How am I going to deal with these things? And so no matter what 
phase of life I'm in or whatever phase of life you're in, you're going to experience new sets of insecurities. I know for some of you, you've been caring for your aging parents. You didn't foresee that or you didn't know all the, all the ins and outs and all the difficulties that was going to be, that was going to pre- be presented to you to take care of your parents in their, in their twilight years as they're, as they're on the home stretch. So no matter what phase you're in, you're going to face some insecurities because we know that we cannot ward off all threats and danger to our personal well-being and our sense of safety. We all have a fundamental desire for security. And the question is, what do we turn to? What do we look to to find stable footing, stable grounding to stand on in our life? Especially when we consider that suffering is an unavoidable reality in life. Suffering makes it hard to feel secure because by its very nature, what suffering does is it threatens our sense of well-being. Suffering and pain threaten to rob us are the very things that we cherish in life. So where do you find your sense of security? That's what I want to ask you this morning to consider. What if you lose your job? For many of us, there's a, there's a legitimate and real sense of security there. So when I talk about security, I'm talking about ultimate sense of security. It's not wrong to find some security, some measure of comfort in the fact that God's given you a job and an income. But what if you lose your job? Or what if you lose your health that keeps you from being able to do your job? What if you lose a loved one? Some of you have. What if someone you love walks out on you? And they abandon you. If you lose these kinds of things, you can lose your security. And suffering, as we said, threatens our sense of security. And one of the beauties of the Bible is that it doesn't shy away from talking about and confronting and discussing the the harsh realities of pain and suffering in this life. And we've been in Romans chapter 8 for a couple of weeks now. This is our third week in Romans 8. And running through, thematically, through Romans 8 is the reality of suffering and of pain in our lives, that we are going to suffer. But along with this hard reality of pain and suffering is a promise to followers of Jesus that God will take all of our pain and suffering and he will use it to accomplish his good purposes for our lives. Because God is that great, that God is that wise, that he can somehow take all our pains and sorrows and he can weave this tapestry and bring something good out of it, used to accomplish his good purposes in our lives. He promises that if you are in Christ, you are ultimately secure. Your ultimate well-being is never in jeopardy. You feel like you're in danger, but your ultimate well-being is never ultimately in jeopardy. Now, I don't know everyone in in the room this morning or everyone who's joining us online, so if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian today, I'd ask you to please think about where you find your sense of security and what you would do if that thing were lost, if it were taken from you. And I would invite you to consider today, just my appeal to you, to consider Christ today and the unshakable security that he offers to all who trust in him. That's my appeal to you this morning. What we're going to do in this passage is we're going to follow Paul's five questions. He asks five questions in this section of scripture that are intended to show Christians this truth. Our security is in Christ. Our security in Christ. That's the big idea. And by pointing out that our security is in Christ, what he wants to do for us, even at an emotional level, is to build our confidence. Is to build our confidence in Christ. So as we walk through the questions, let's, let's, let's think about our security being in Christ and where our confidence lies. The first question is this. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the, well, that was the first line, I think, of the first song that we sang this morning. That's the first question we're looking at. Technically, the first question in this passage is, what then shall we say to these things? Paul asks. It's kind of an introductory type question, which leads to the one that, you know, if God's for us, who can be against us? In other words, he's saying, what should our response be to the things that he's just written? Well, because we teach expositionally through passages of the Bible, we have to ask the question, what things is he talking about? We've got to back up and re- review a little bit. Verse 28. This is what he's just said. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So the subject at hand is God's absolute commitment to the good of his people, to work for our good, to never stop working for our good. He promises to take every single thing in your life. Notice it said all things, every single thing, which includes all the painful things, all the terrible things, all the really hard things, all the things that cause you sorrow, all the things that cause you grief and tears and anxiety and anguish. God will take all those things 
And in his magnificent providence, he's somehow going to weave them and turn them into something that's going to accomplish good in your life. He's going to work out his good purposes for you. Now, this is not saying that everything you experience is good, because it's not. Those sorrows, those sufferings, God never calls them good. He works good out. You guys got to see that distinction there, right? And this is one of the things that I would wrestle with the Lord with over is that I just want to do things his way, right? I think it was J. Vernon McGee, old school Bible teacher. I, l- I love this. He, he would say, this is God's universe and God does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. It's just so true. Like if I, so, so I can argue with God and say, I don't want these things. And that's okay. I think we should pray for deliverance. It's okay to lay your heart out, bear your heart. Psalm 62 says, pour out your hearts before him and trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart. This is not to say we just lay down and we say, well, bring on the suffering. It's okay. I know you're doing something good. So I don't want you to hear me saying that this morning because this is not some triumphalistic sort of, well, it's all just going to work out for the better. It's acknowledging there is pain, but we're also acknowledging that God is wise and he puts these things at work for our good, including all the hard things. So when we hear that God works out all things for our good, what we have to come to terms with is the good that we want may not be the good that God's after. So for me, if I'm in pain, I think the ultimate good and the best and quickest good that I need right now is for you to take this away from me right now, God. But again, it's not my universe, and I'm not God. So we have to understand contextually in this passage, when we look at Romans, 28, Romans 8, verses 28 through 30, is the good, the ultimate good that God is working toward. It may not be your definition of good, but this is God's definition of good. And it's two things, and we're going to look at it in a second. It's conformity to Christ and our ultimate glorification. When our transformation into Christ's likeness is complete, when we see him as he is, the resurrection of our bodies, new glorified resurrected bodies like Jesus has. This is, so these are the two goods, conformity to Christ and our ultimate glorification in, when the transformation is complete. Look at verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that's good number one, in order that he might be the firstborn among among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. You see that? That's, That's the end goal. That's the end good. God is, from eternity past, God has envisioned in his mind and planned in his mind to bring believers, to to bring uh, his children in Christ, to, to call them, to justify them, that is to declare them righteous, and ultimately to, to glorify them, to bring us into his presence. And so here you have to see the logical connection between uh, verses 28 to 30 with where we are in 31. And here's the idea. If in eternity past, God predestined to make us like his son Jesus, and if he's promised to perfect us and bring us into an eternal future with him, doesn't that prove that God is for us? Like from eternity past to eternity future, God has planned our salvation and told us he's going to work out our good. Do you need more proof? That's the proof, is what he's saying, that God is for us. And so he says, and if God is for us, and he is, then who can be against us? Answer? No one. Nothing. We're going to see a lot of rhetorical questions here. He's making a point. The Apostle Paul likes to ask rhetorical questions to get his readers to think in their minds, no, there's nothing. No one can stand against us. Now, listen, there may be people that you feel are opposed to you, people who have made themselves enemies against you. You may feel the world is against you. And so in that sense, yes, people can be against you. But again, we're talking in the ultimate sense here. If God is for you, then ultimately no one can be against you because God has purposed to do good in your life and no one can take that away. No one can undermine the good work that God intends to do in your life, even in the face of suffering, even in the face of pain, right? Now, I'm not making light of suffering here. This is not a triumphalistic, let's just kind of glaze over and glibly pass over people's pain and suffering. But as we think in ultimate senses, in the ultimate sense of suffering, I mean, think about this. If you lose your job, that can be really devastating, super troubling. I'm not making light of it. But there is a sense in which if you understand that God is working out good for your life, as Darren said last week, God has a plan. So you don't have to feel if you lose your job, even though it may feel like this initially, life is spinning out of control. How am I going to provide? 
How am I going to live? Life is not out of control if your life is in Christ. And you can know then that though you lose your job and though you lose your income from that job, God is working out a plan. Now, his plan may not be to bring you to a better job. Well, you got a better assignment on the way. Maybe it's a worse assignment. I mean, have you ever lost your job and gone to a worse job? That can happen. Even that will not undermine God's good plan for your life, right? Or let's say your house burns down. I was thinking about this so as not to feel like, hey, we're just going to throw some silver linings on these things. That's not the point. If my house burned down, I would be devastated. But in the ultimate sense, when I read the Bible, when I think about God and my future, though my house burned down, I have an, I have an eternal home. I have an eternal home. That all the things that we own are destined for the garbage dump. They're dust, destined to decay. Or let's say a family member cheats you out of your inheritance and you were planning on some of your, your later years when you're no longer able to work to use this inheritance and some family member cheats you out of that. Again, not to downplay the severity of that and the suffering that might be involved in that, but you have an eternal inheritance. That First Peter says is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's untouchable. No one can steal it from you. No one can take it from you. Or let's say, horrible worst case scenario, somebody kills you. Now, murder is a horrible, heinous crime against God, who is the author of life and alone determines who should live and who should die. But even if you were killed, where do you go if you're in Christ? You immediately go to be in the presence of the Lord. Paul says, far better to depart and to be with Christ. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Which is why then Jesus would say in the Gospels that we shouldn't fear those who can only kill the body and after that do no more, but fear God who has the power to kill the body and cast your soul into hell. Now, not to be cowering and fearful of God in that sense, but revere God as the one who's in ultimate control of your life. Those things I just described, those are painful, horrible things. Not to downplay them and not to slap a Bible verse on top of our pain and to ignore it, but to say, this is the context that Paul is getting us to think about is in the ultimate sense of where our sense of security and well-being lies. So he's telling us all these things. We're reminded God's for us. Our ultimate hope is secure in Christ. No one can take it from you. So the first question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? No one. The second question is, how will he not also with him, that is God, not also with him, Jesus, graciously give us all things? That's the second question. Now, it, it comes up, that's the second half of verse 32. So let's look at the whole of verse 32 to understand the question. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him, that is Christ, graciously give us all things? Now, if we needed proof, more proof, that God is for us, this is it. Paul does what Jesus often does, is he argues here, logically, from the greater to the lesser. He argues from something greater to, to show that something lesser would be true as well. Let me give you an example. If you had a heart attack and I gave you CPR and I saved you, would I be unwilling next week to give you a Band-Aid if you cut your finger? Right? If I saved your life, you're not going to hesitate to ask me for a Band-Aid. That would be absurd. You see the greater to the lesser. And that's what Paul's doing here. If God's already given us the supreme and costliest gift he could give for our greatest need, which is salvation, how could God not also give us all the smaller things that we would need in life? That would be like willing to save a person from a heart attack but not give them a Band-Aid. That's absurd. So if God is willing to, to, to give his son the greatest gift, why would he not also give you all the smaller things that you need in life. And our insecurities and anxieties in life come precisely from our belief that we will not have what we need or that God may not give us what we need in the moment that we need it. And Paul is saying here, God will supply every need that you have. To me, verse 32 is maybe the most confident, grounding, helpful verse in all the Bible for me. When I understand the costly nature of what God gave us in the cross of his son Jesus then whatever situation I'm facing this week, whatever situation you are facing, whatever suffering, whatever anxiety, whatever fear, God will meet you and God will bring you through. Now we see things very cloudy. We don't see the end of the situation, but God does. And he knows the good that he's working out. And so that's where we walk by faith and not by sight. If we walk by sight, we just can see how God's gonna work everything out. But he hasn't given us omniscience. 
And sometimes our anxieties stem from the fact that we want to be omniscient like God. We just wish to know how this is all going to play out. And he just hasn't given us that. He calls us to trust him as a loving father, but he has promised us. He is for us. Nothing can be against us, and he will supply what we need when we need it. I love what John Stott wrote. He said, the cross is the guarantee of the continuing and unfailing generosity of God. So when you wonder if you will have what you need in your pain and in your suffering, then remember the cross of Jesus and go from the greater to the lesser. Now, the third question that Paul asks is in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now, envision a courtroom scene where charges are brought against someone where a sentencing, a conviction may take place. This is what Paul is kind of envisioning. Paul says in the second part of the verse, it is God who justifies. So who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That is those whom he has predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's children. No prosecution can succeed against God's elect because God the judge has already justified them. He's already acquitted us of sin and accepted us as his own. So no charge can be brought against us. And he essentially restates the question then in, 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 the fourth, in the next verse, in verse 34, which is the fourth question, relatedly, which helps us understand where he's going. Who is to condemn? That's what he means. Who can bring a charge? That is, who could can rightly condemn believers in Christ of sin and, of, and to be in wrong standing with God? No one once again, can legitimately condemn God's people for sin. Why not? If you remember Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, why is there no longer condemnation? Didn't Paul prove his point, especially in Romans chapter 3, 1 through 3, that we're all sinners, that we all stand guilty and condemned before the bar in the courtroom of God's judgment because we're guilty of sin. So why are believers in Christ no longer condemned for their sin. Well, remember what he said in verse 3 of chapter 8. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. The reason no one can condemn us is because God already condemned our sin in the death of Jesus. That's the idea of Jesus giving his life in our place. He stood in our place and he took the condemnation, the punishment for our sin that was owed to us, and we are acquitted of our sin and declared righteous. That's why no one can legitimately condemn us for our sin. People might look at your life and say, I see the sin in your life, I see the wrong in your life, I know you did this, and I know you did this, and I know you did this. And what you do is in your heart, you remind yourself that Jesus paid the price, and he stood in your place, and he received the condemnation that was due you for your sin. Therefore, no one can rightly condemn you. Now, here in verse 34, he adds a little bit to to this idea of, of why we're not condemned. He speaks about the death. Look at verse uh, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. So he died to take our penalty. More than that, he was raised, which means his sacrifice was accepted, who is at the right hand of God and who is interceding for us. He's praying for us. In Romans chapter 8, you see the Spirit of God is praying for us in accordance with God's will. He intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And now we have Jesus, the Son of God, interceding for us. If he stands in the gap for us, and is praying, what kind of disposition does Jesus have toward you? He is for you. He's not against you. If he is standing there interceding, he is praying in accordance with the Father's will for your life. So our prayers may not feel like they're, they're landing anywhere, but the prayers of Jesus do. And they go right into the heart of God. The Spirit of God himself as well is interceding for you. You get to Hebrews chapter, I don't know, where, Hebrews chapter 7, the Son of God uh, Jesus stands and lives to make intercession for us continually, that God is for us. And therefore, we, there's no one to condemn us. The point of all this is there's no condemnation, there's no fear in us about our sin anymore because we stand secure in God. Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins. He's sitting at the right hand of God triumphantly and he's interceding for us. And he's telling us, Paul is, so that we know we're secure, God is for us. And therefore, if all of this is true, then we can have confidence in Christ in every situation in our lives. Now, here's the fifth and final question. Paul's reaching a crescendo. He's pointing to this climactic truth that our lives are ultimately secure in Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What's the answer? No one. No thing. Right? Now, God hasn't promised to keep us safe from all danger and harm in this life. 
I wish that he had. Because I have three daughters, and my concern is for their safety. My concern is for their well-being. And so I know that they are exposed in this broken side of eternity to dangers in this life. I'm less concerned about physical dangers, like car accidents, although I'm concerned about that too. My daughter's going to be able, legitimate to take driver's ed in, I don't know, like half a year. I'm like, that's absurd. We're not doing this. <laughs> so maybe I have more fear than I'm admitting to you now. It's just kind of coming out as I'm, as I'm thinking. But I'm concerned for their emotional safety because there's so much abuse and so much wrongdoing and so much perversion in the world. And I do pray for their safety in every respect. And it's right to do that. But I know that God has not promised to keep us safe and exempt from all suffering. I mean, Jesus was exposed to danger and suffering. Why should we be? I mean, it's clear that there is danger. And we're going to look at this verse. I mean, it's right there. Like, believers are exposed to these things. But the reality is, is despite these dangers, despite these distresses and sufferings, we are never separated from the love of Christ. We are secure in his love. Listen to 35 and 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. This is a very common temptation when you are suffering, is to think God doesn't care. And you may wonder, does God really love me? Because, I mean, if if my child was suffering, I would do everything in my power to alleviate and to take away that suffering. And God is not taking away this pain. And therefore, I wonder, does he really love me? Is he really good? Because I feel abandoned by God. I feel like God's not loving me right now. That would be the temptation, and Paul knows that, which is why he says, no, suffering cannot keep you from the love of Christ. And he runs through a litany of things. Not tribulation, so various afflictions and sufferings of this life, like unemployment, or infertility, or miscarriage, homelessness, cancer, disease, mental illness, Alzheimer's, dementia. These tribulations will not separate you from the love of God in Christ. He says not distress. What is distressing you right now? What's that area of your life in your heart that it's just like, oh, God. Even that will not separate you from the love of Christ. Not persecution. Now, I think we, um, Lori was up here. She prayed for Myanmar. I think of our friends, Pastor Nopum and Pastor Timothy over in Myanmar, who both told me separately on different, different times I was hanging out with them that they have had people pelt their houses with rocks while the church was meeting there. And in fact, the biblical testimony about persecution is not, is the exact opposite that God's far from you, that the love of God is far from you when you're being persecuted. In fact, the special presence of God is promised to those, his nearness to those who are suffering for the sake of the faith. Not persecution, not famine, not nakedness, danger, or sword. God will not abandon us in our suffering. Whether it's poverty, poverty is not a sign that God has abandoned you. I mean, look at this, nakedness, famine, hunger, that will not separate you from the love of God in Christ. In fact, so, so Paul's laying it on really thick here. Here's all these troubles. Here's all these distresses. And we might conclude from these things just in our natural minds. That, well, God must have, like, I'm losing in life. Like, things are failing. Everything's breaking down. Everything's disintegrating under my suffering. And he goes the opposite direction. Verse 37, look. No. <laughs> no. You see, he knows our, in- our inclination is to think, We're being destroyed in all of this. No. In all these things. What things did he just list? Sufferings. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, the phrase, we are more than conquerors in the Greek is actually just one word. It's a a singular uh, word. It's a present tense verb. It's a present tense verb that means in Christ, we are completely victorious. We are completely prevailing is what it means. We're always winning, even in our pain, which is interesting, right? Because when you're suffering, you just feel like you're losing, like you're losing everything. And I know it's hard to reconcile this truth that we are completely victorious in Christ when it just feels like loss after loss after loss is being piled one upon another. 
And Paul is saying, no, we are actually completely victorious. We're always winning, even if it feels like we're losing. Because we're stable, we're secure. Nothing of our hope in Christ is being touched. Nothing of ultimate significance is being taken away from us. Now, I don't even like, you know, it means we're completely victorious. I don't really, I've never really liked the word victory. Because in Christian circles, it kind of just gets thrown around by pastors who don't define it and just leaves people to fill in the blanks. Leading people to think victory means that you're going to go from the bad job to a better job. Your victory is coming. And like I said, you can go from a bad job to a worse job. Or it leads people to think that, that if you have some health crisis, victory in the health crisis means that you will receive physical healing. That is not promised. Sometimes God does physically heal. Praise God for that but it is not promised. So victory in a health crisis may be what I've seen, I think, in the lives of believers who have died of their disease, who up until the end were grateful for their life, were worshiping God, who were still walking faithfully, demonstrating great faith in him, and they died in great faith. They died with gratitude in their hearts, and they they died with worship. That's being completely victorious. God gets him to the end. He opens the door to eternity. Our ultimate healing is in resurrection. And we pray for healing now. If you are sick, let me know. I will pray for your healing. People did that for me, and I praise God. But we got to keep our eyes on resurrection. We have an untouchable life and inheritance in the presence of God forever and ever. And notice that this victory is not through our own strength. It's not through our own faith. It is through him we are conquerors, through his strength not ours. Therefore, you can say, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God is for me. No matter what I'm going through, God is always working for my good. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to say. Now, Paul's the one who asked the question in verse 35. He's not content with us to just answer it ourselves, even though he wants to say nothing can separate. He's going to tell us. He's going to be more explicit. He goes on, answers the question himself in verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see that phrase? No, nor anything else in all creation. Does that pretty much cover the bases? Raise your hand if you can think of something outside of creation. You can't do it. Well, God is the only one outside of creation. And God's the one saying nothing in all creation, nothing under the sun, will keep you, separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not your depression in the present. Not your debilitating anxiety about the future. Not your loneliness. Not your fear. Not your disease. Not even your death. In fact, death will be what God uses to open the door to bring you further and deeper in to the love of God that's in Christ. It's like we sing in the, in the song in Christ alone. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I stand. This is about the absolute security of the believer. Your father will not abandon you. He will not let you go. Even if the present is painful, you are secure in his love. Listen, you're secure in his love even if you don't feel it. Feelings are a good thing. They can be a good thing, but they can also be misleading. Six years ago, I was lying in a hospital bed, recovering from brain surgery to remove a cancerous tumor. And my soul was in the valley of the shadow of death. I've always been a fairly upbeat person, by disposition and wiring, fairly positive. Never had experienced severe depression and... I just felt like my soul was destitute. There was a blackness around my soul. I was devoid of even a shred, an ounce of any joy, any feeling of pleasure, anything good, any happiness. And my wife was really worried about me. And I just, I just felt like God was a million miles away. My perception was, God's not here. But his promise was, I'm here. So my mind went to the scripture. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
My mind went to Jesus on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I felt forsaken. My perception was that I was forsaken. But his promise was that Jesus went to the cross for me and was forsaken for my sake so that I could be with God and never truly be forsaken. Your perceptions are not as reliable as his promises. I'll flip that around. His promises are more reliable than your perceptions. If you've never trusted in Christ, then this is the best news that you've ever heard and will ever hear. There's a God who has done something to rescue you from sin and death. There's a God who gave his son the greatest gift he could give to give you life. He offers you forgiveness. He offers you a new hope. He offers you a new life. He offers you now and forever an unshakable security that will never be taken away. An inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Today can be the day of salvation for you. If you trust in him. And if you are in Christ, and brother and sister, I say to you, if you are in distress, is hang on. Hang on by grace. There's a new world coming. See, I'm talking on the individual level, but here's the truth, friends. There is a new world coming. He's going to remake this world. He's going to make all things new. And God will give you everything you need every single day of your life until he gets you there. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Oh God, we are grateful um, for the promise of a new world coming. That these things that are individual to us, that mean so much to us, they're all wrapped up within this greater narrative, this greater redemption that is coming where you are um, going to fix this broken world and our broken bodies and our broken life and eradicate all sin, all evil, all injustice, all suffering, all pain. And we'll make all things new. You'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain because you're going to make all things new. And we bless you for that. We praise you for that. Help us to trust you and find our security in you. Pray now in your name. Amen.